200th episode of The Good Dram Show with me, Chris Goodrum. Um, right, I'm back. I uh, hope you all had a, a really good Christmas and uh, New Year and hopefully um, Santa bought you some nice drams, shall we say. So uh, anyway, we're back. It's the New Year. It's the 200th episode of the show. Ah, great milestone, it has to be said. I mean, um, I suppose a few, those of you with... Uh, long memories or can be asked to basically go back through all the other hundred odd episodes of the show you'll remember that uh, episode 100 which was uh, a pretty pretty good show I think you know a milestone show um, featured um, the iconic uh, George T Stagg and the Stagg Jr. Um, so episode 200 gonna have to top that one aren't I it has to be said so um, we're back in America again. I mean, there's no title page because I didn't want to kind of give it away before we got there, you know, if you see what I mean. So um, the kind of the, the sort of the, the raison d'etre, for want of a better word, for this episode of the show is, is kind of twofold. Three of the samples um, were my last tasting for the, the whiskey magazine, which I tasted back in October and um, has, uh, you know, the, the episode of the issue of the magazine is obviously now out um, so three of them come from that and three come from a, a box of samples that I just well I was clearing up some samples and stuff and uh, I guess back in the day I wasn't quite so uh, anally retentive with regards to sort of putting down the names and uh, information on the sample bottles that were left over from various tastings such as the World Whiskey Awards and so I found this box with a load of samples uh, the date it actually back to the 2012 World Whiskey Awards when back in those days we got to taste a broader range of stuff in, in the first round and three of these samples obviously from the American samples that, that uh, I tasted back then. I mean nowadays the Americans get to do round one, the Japanese get to do round one of the Japanese whiskies, we get all the rest but you know one can be feel a bit miffed that we're missing something but um, also long gone are the days where it seems there was only a handful of judges doing round one. I mean, you know, again, going back to sort of, what, what 2014, um, you'd get sort of basically a big box and you'd get Space Eye and you'd get the damn lot, you know, you'd get the No Age, the 12s, or up to 12, uh, the 13 to 15, the 21, you know, all, all of them basically. Uh, this time round, I just got Space Eye 21 years and over. Admittedly, I also got um, Irish Blended, which was really interesting in actual fact. So, less tasting in round one, which is a bit of a shame because it means less samples. But anyway, um, that's by the by. So, basically, today's episode of the show, I'm hoping, is going to be a one-up on the George T. Stagg versus Stagg Jr. Uh, I've got what I think is some really, really interesting liquid in these glasses. So, let's run the title page then. Right, okay, so uh, we're going to kick off. Now, this was a difficult one, it has to be said. Um, different age statements, no age statements, different ABVs. Uh, just like, where the hell do I start? And I did think about starting with the, 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 the Weller because it's the odd black man out being the wheated bourbon. Um, but then I thought, well, God, that's bottled at over 60%. You know, how can I start tasting with a 61% bloody whiskey? You know, got to start somewhere else. So, we're going to kick off with the Mitchell's 10 year old. Now this is a bottle of 47.2. Uh, now, Mitchell's has been around for a couple of years now, as you well know, and initially there was a bit of mmm about Mitchell's. They didn't have a distillery, they were sourcing their, uh, their spirit. And I've been reading in on social media that the same thing seems to be being said about a number of these new Irish brands that have been, have been propping up. Um, and although people have not been saying they're trying to dupe uh, you, the consumer, um, into sort of saying, you know, we have a distillery, uh, or they seem to be, or the critics, should we say, seem to be implying that. I mean, but anyone with half a brain and an interest in Irish whiskey knows that there's only really the three big players in Irish whiskey. And if you're going to be bottling uh, a whiskey with some relative amount of age statement to it, you know, five years plus, it's pretty much odds on it's going to come from one of those three guys, you know. Um, and as long as it doesn't say this comes from Distillery X on the bottle when we damn sure know that it doesn't come from that distillery, 
I've got no issue with that. I mean, it's it's the quality of what's in the bottle that uh, that counts at the end of the day. So, so to be honest with you, I don't really care where they where they got this ten year old spirit from. What I do care about is the fact that this is over a hundred pounds a bottle. Um, in actual fact, I saw it on for one hundred and twenty eight ninety five for a ten year old bourbon. I mean, you know. Put it into perspective, you can buy the 12 year old Elijah Craig, which is probably going to disappear fairly shortly, for £41, £42. You've got the Eagle Rare 10 year olds, um, although, okay, this is a single barrel bottling, and the Eagle Rare 10 year olds is a single barrel bottling, and that's half the price. So they're asking an awful lot for this, uh, this 10 year old, so um, it'll be interesting to see whether, whether it's actually uh, worth the three figures or not. The second bottling we're going to be looking at is uh, a new bottling. Uh, it is um, the Old Forester 1920s Prohibition style uh, bourbon. And uh, uh, it comes as part of their Old Forester Whiskey Row series. Uh, I think this is the third expression and is um, a homage, I guess, to uh, the Prohibition era whiskies that were being bottled and I believe that Old Forester was one of the few distilleries that actually had a license to produce um, liquor as you Americans would say uh, for medicinal purposes um, so obviously what's in the bottle doesn't date from the 1920s if it did it would be worth an absolute arm and a leg I mean even so um, the um, it's going for uh, what was it, 149, I think I've seen it, uh, 150 pounds a bottle. Um, so again, we're talking an awful lot of money, and um, it's uh, yeah. So it's basically a throwback to to the 1920 style. Maybe I don't know. Never tasted a whiskey from the 1920s uh, or an American whiskey from the 1920s. So uh, it's going to be difficult to say. All I can do is judge it on its quality here and now. So, so that's that one. So that should be interesting. Now, now we're going to go on to the Larue Weller. Now, I, I mean, I don't know how much this is going for now. <laughs> silly money I would imagine even if you can get hold of it I mean this is the 2012 bottling uh, which was uh, bottled at 61.7 percent um, <laughs> BV considering it's well over eight years old um, or at least eight years old I believe uh, or that particular bottling was so it's the wheated bourbon it's the odd man out relatively speaking with regards to this tasting um, for you, I imagine most of you know what a wheated bourbon is, but for those of you that don't, a wheated bourbon is essentially um, a bourbon, 51% corn, and instead of using a percentage of rye, they use, corn, they use uh, wheat. Fairly straightforward. Uh, I don't know the exact proportion of the... Um, the wheat in the the the, the weller the uh, buffalo trace no, don't seem to be particularly keen on sharing that information with regards to what goes into their mash bill but that that's essentially what you have as you know bourbon has to be a minimum of 51 percent corn then you can use anything else generally speaking you'll use rye a little bit of malted barley not generally for the for the flavor but for kick-starting the fermentation and then you can use a bit of wheat you can use a bit of maize you can use well, basically whatever you like um but obviously by using a proportion of, uh, of wheat instead of the rye, you get the wheated bourbon. And they generally, I, I love them, I think they're great, there's just not very many of them about. And uh, I think they have a very distinctive character all of their own, which we shall hopefully find out. Fourth bottling we're going to be looking at again is from the Buffalo Trace Stable. This is the Eagle Rare 17. Um, now, I think if uh, memory serves me right, this is their low rye uh, mash bill that makes up the, uh, the, the, the Eagle Rare range. So it's sort of 70, 80 odd percent sort of uh, corn with maybe about 5% rye, something like that. So pretty low rye. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see, you know, does the rye kind of kick in and balance up the corn? You know, we shall see. And then we're going to move on to... Oh, 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 oh. Gold dust. I mean, this is probably, well, if you were to get hold of a full-sized bottle of Pappy Van Winkle 20-year-old, which is what is in this sample, I mean, can you believe it? Back in 2012, they were putting Pappy into the World Whiskey Awards. And, um, well, basically, if you can get hold of a bottle, um, you're looking at... Oof, 
I think I saw it for about 1,500 quid. I mean, so this little dram is worth several hundred pounds in its own own right. So this is the 20-year-old family reserve bourbon. Uh, it was uh, bottled at 45.2%. So that should be really interesting. And you think I'm going to top that? Well, possible I'm going to top it with this little baby. This is the brand new bottling in the Parker's Heritage series. I believe it is uh, the 10th, I think, uh, release in the series. Uh, I could well be wrong, and I'm sure somebody will tell me if I am. But, now... Parker's Heritage Series, I've reviewed a couple of those bottles in the past and they do some interesting stuff, different strains of barley, all that kind of stuff, but barley, corn uh, and uh, what have you, different types of oak. Um, this, this baby is going to be really, really interesting. This is 24 years old and the juice comes from the old um, Heaven Hill Distillery which was uh, destroyed by fire in 1996. Uh, now, I know that Jim Murray bashed on about how brilliant um, the uh, spirit flowing from those stills was, and, and I've never had the opportunity to, to taste uh, whiskey from the, the, the old distillery, or obviously all the old, the, the, the current Heaven Hill that I've tasted is obviously all from the, the new plant that was built after the, the fire. So this should be really, really interesting. Uh, it is bottled at 50% ABV, I believe bottled in bond. Um, and uh, it is, uh, like I said, uh, what are they, uh, part of this heritage, 300 quid a bottle? Anyway, so, bottled in bond business, you put, again, there's a lot of jargon with American whiskey, I guess Americans love their, their jargon. Uh, what is this bottled in bond business? Well, essentially it is what it says, it is bottled in bond. Um, it kind of dates back to uh, 1897 when it, when it was originally um, brought in as a kind of uh, quality control. Uh, it stated that it had to be a minimum, the spirit had to be a minimum of uh, four years old, it had, it had to be uh, stored in uh, a legally approved bonded warehouse and bottled in bond. It has to be a product of one single season's distillation, so from one year and it had to be bottled at a minimum of 100 proof or 50 percent abv it was basically because at the time just like the, the whiskey industry at the time uh, there was a, a lot of uh, illicit uh, production and you know a lot of shockingly bad spirit well, only one of those things still exists in actual fact today there's still some shockingly bad spirit knocking about but realistically now that the whole bottled in bond business is I guess a marketing kind of thing. Um, yes, you obviously still have to have the, the stru you know, structure in place. You have to basically follow the rules with regards to that. But most of the distilleries are now producing quality spirits, so it's it's more a marketing thing than it is an actual sort of. This is definitely a quality spirit. But you know, it's another one of those kind of little quirks. So anyway, I think I've. Uh, waffled uh, away <laughs> hopefully I haven't bored you to tears um, so I think we better get on and uh, taste some whiskey then don't you right, okay, so let's kick off with the mixtures let's see what the nose gives us on this then shall we corn heavy um, nice robust moderately fat I would say um, it's got a nice fleshy feel. There's a little bit of caramel. There's a little bit of herbal rye in the background, a little bit of spice, um, some wood notes. Not hugely vanillaed, uh, which is quite nice. So, so again, the, the, the spirit is definitely doing the talking, should we say. Um, it's got a little bit of chocolatiness, uh, a little bit of herbalness. Yeah, really soft, quite sexy spices. It has to be said. This is um, this is a lovely nose. Um, a, a, you know, pretty impressive. It has to be said. I mean, it certainly ticks all the boxes for me as regards um, you know, the sort of style of bourbon that I kind of like. Um, it's not too fat. Like I said, there's a nice nip from the from the rye. Again, I mean, it's fairly low rye content so you're looking I guess at no more than 10% and it certainly feels nicely integrated it's it's, it's pleasant 
I do kind of think that it's that a hundred odd pound a bottle for this is a little bit overpriced for uh, what it actually is. Um, I mean, certainly, it's no no better or worse than say the Eagle Rare Ten. Um, anyway, let's uh, let's see what the palette gives us, then, shall we? Mm, that's a lovely intensity. And it kind of fits with the Mitchell's profile. I mean, when um, when we had uh, customers coming in the shop over the Christmas period and they wanted a basic rundown of the, of the, of the whole Bourbon range kind of thing, um, the word that came to mind with regards to Mitchell's is very natural. It's got a, a, a natural woody kind of intensity. Um, it's not kind of soft and polished like some of the other bourbons. Um, it's got some grip to it, and this one's got some lovely chocolatiness. It's darker on the palate. The, the, the rye is a little bit more further forward um, in the mix uh, with that lovely sort of chocolatey sort of spice. There's some old wood notes, some um, tannins, yeah, a little bit of bitterness, but certainly nothing that's going to get bent out of shape. The corn is all just sat in the background. It's kind of fairly neutral it has to be said uh, it's just giving it kind of a, a nice body to it, a bit of weight um, and yeah it's lovely and chocolatey that's that's a really really nice bourbon I don't think it's worth a hundred and something odd pounds a bottle but it's pretty good nevertheless right, okay, so let's move on to the old forester then Subtler nose, softer, um, more whiskey-like. I mean, I'm not a big fan of old, the, the basic Old Forester. I think it's a bit... Mm, I think I might have re reviewed that in the past. Um, this has got a lovely elegance to it, a delicacy. Um, I mean, I would have just expected, you know, Prohibition-era um, whiskies to be a lot rougher, should we say. Um, and so I would have expected something more along the lines of the Mitchters in style, but it certainly hasn't. It's more in that polished, elegant, again, some lovely um, corn notes, fairly fat. Um, the rye is more herbal. Don't get a lot of spices, but I'm getting a lot of herbal notes. You know, that herbally rye kind of character. Um, a little bit of buttered, burnt toast touch of caramel yeah the, the, the corn is really kind of coming through it's really silky it's full mm. I mean that is a lovely nose again it's just almost the polar opposite in style to the Mitchters. it's very very polished and very elegant and very very nice anyway let's uh, let's see what the palette gives us Well, that's got some tannin, but it's really dusty kind of tannin, dry, not spicy, but just dry and kind of sort of gritty, but not gritty, if you see what I mean. It's, it's not kind of rough and ready, natural like. It's very polished, very elegant. Again, at the length on that is absolutely stunning. Um, again, the rye is kind of sat back in the mix. You're getting plenty of the slightly um, carameled uh, corn up front. Um, and a lot of herbalness from the rye. The rye is giving it that lovely herbal intensity. It's very soft. There's a touch of spice on the finish, but it kind of, in the mid palate, you really get all that kind of dusty kind of uh, tannins and um, woodiness, uh, which is really, really nice. And then that kind of fades out and you come back to the corn and a smidgen of spice, a little bit of chocolate right on the finish. I mean, that is an impressive uh, whiskey, it has to be said. It's got progression, which is something I often bang on about, as you well know. Um, that is seriously not one-dimensional. That is very, very good, but very different to the Mitchers.
Right, okay. The behemoth time then. 60 odd percent uh, whiskey then. Let's, uh, let's see what the nose gives us on this then, shall we? Do you know why that doesn't smell like a 60 odd percent whiskey? I mean, that is really quite restrained. It's dark, it's treacly, it's really wheaty. I mean, it has that sort of. I mean, I find with wheated bourbons that they have an almost kind of wheaty, bran flaky kind of character. Um, and you can really smell that, you know, um, really toffee, really treacly, thick, dark, spicy, wheaty. Oh, it's just an absolutely stunning nose. The depth on this is just incredible. Um, there's a little bit of oak just at the edges. There's a little bit of corn, but even though the... the the wheat component isn't going to be particularly um, high, one would imagine. It certainly seems to be really, really dominating. And that's what I love about the LaRue Weller. It is just just dark. You know, this is dark and intense. Um, and, and I guess where the stag kind of like grabs you by the throat and sort of punches you in the face, this is a lot more subtle. Um, this is a lot more kind of... Um, Relaxed, shall we say, I think is probably the, uh, the the best way of describing that. Oh, that is absolutely stunning. Let's see what the palate gives us. Tell that's got 60 odd percent alcohol. Whoa. That takes no prisoners on the palate. Again, dark, treacly, wheaty, intense, but subtle as well. It's got some. It's got some light and shade to it. It's got some slightly delicate um, corn notes in amongst that. It's got some bitter wood. It's got some bitter chocolate. Um, but it never gets out of shape. Again, the the, the corn is all kind of like you know just enveloping it, softening it at the edges, um, but the bitterness on the tongue and the wood notes and the and the, the, the sort of wheaty, treacly kind of character is just like, mm, it's in there, you know. Um, and that's what I love about that, the, the, this whiskey, and this is what I love about it. You know, the, the, the depth and breadth of American whiskey, you know, a lot of people think that they're all very much the same, but you can be assured that they certainly are not all the same. And and although that is, you know, several several hundred pounds now a bottle, I one would imagine I should have looked it up. I mean, I, I think the last time I think I was flogging it, it was it was well over a hundred pounds, hundred and twenty, hundred and thirty, I think something of that kind of ilk. But damn, that's good. Right, okay, so let's move on to the Eagle Rare 17. I guess with hindsight, I probably should have done this before the Weller, because um, that's kind of just <laughs> hammered my palate, shall we say. But anyway, we shall, we shall, we shall push on, because that's what we do here, you know. Anyway, um, let's, uh, let's see what the nose gives us. I guess after the Weller, it's going to seem really, really subtle, and it is very, very subtle. Um, slightly earthy. Again, it's got that lovely herbal rye kind of character, a bit like the um, the old Forester in actual fact. Again, the rye is not sort of like um, huge. It's 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 kind of quite nicely integrated. It's got the sort of subtlety of the corn notes, a little bit of dark wood, a little bit of treacle, a little bit of burnt toffee, some subtle spices. It's all very relaxed and and. Lovely, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess sort of like the, tr the I pro like I said, I probably should have done this one before the uh, the Weller, because um, this has got some lovely maturity. But uh, it's always difficult to pick out maturity in American whiskies. I find um, you, you can obviously tell when they're young; they have that slightly Mari kind of character and that 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 youthful intensity. Um, but sort of. When they get to kind of like this sort of age, which is, for an, a bourbon, pretty old. When you think about it, most bourbons will tend to be bottled anywhere between three and eight years of age. 
um, because of the, 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 the warmer atmosphere, the fact that they mature quicker. Yeah, you very rarely come across a bourbon you know, that's 20-odd that's plus years. Um, they just generally don't tend to sort of go that kind of length of time. I mean, there are obviously exceptions, because these two are the exception. Um, so 17 is pretty old, and um, it's got a lovely kind of laid-back, I'm getting some slightly tobacco-y kind of smoke notes coming out now. Um, it's old wood notes, uh, which is uh, what tends to come through on the nose with with this particular bottling. It's um, less about the spirit per se, although the spirit character is absolutely lovely. It's more about those sort of old kind of tertiary wood notes. Um, and this is just a, a gorgeous, beautiful, mature whiskey. Let's, um, let's see if the palate is up to it, shall we? Delicate, elegant, soft, <laughs> surprisingly a little bit of rose petal ma kind of character just creeping in at the end there, which I'm quite surprised given the age of it. Slightly woody, again, like, like the nose, the, 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 the palette does seem to be sort of emphasising those kind of old wood notes, the sl dusty spices, a little bit of chocolate. The corn is kind of sat back, it's all very relaxed. There's there's not a great deal of input from the rye. There's a little bit of herbalness um, and maybe a little bit of spice. But again, it's it seems to be more focused on the actual wood character than the, than the spirit. Um, and it's just wonderfully elegant, delicate. I mean, yes, all right, it's 46%. It's not... And it's just come after a 60 odd percent brute of a, of, of a whiskey, and so maybe that is kind of like almost emphasizing its kind of laid back and sort of um, soft nature, shall we say. But even so, that is just, just that's just a gorgeous sipping bourbon if you've got the money for it, shall we say. Right, pappy time. <laughs> Let's, uh, let's see what the nose gives us on this end, shall we? Now, I th before I dip, stick my toes in, I think that the, um, the mash bill, I think if I'm right in saying, is similar to the, um, the Eagle Rare, so it's the, 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 the low rye mash bill, but uh, let's, uh, let's see what the nose gives us. Oh, that is damn fine. It's elegant, it's delicate, um, it's got a lovely kind of sort of almost kind of orange conserve kind of character. It's got very focused, it's very fresh, almost kind of citric. Um, there's a little bit of rye, um, giving it a little bit of herbalness. The corn is, is it's vibrant, it's, it's, it's not fat and flabby and relaxed. It's just, it's an intensity that, that uh, this nose has. Um, bit of smoke, bit of tobacco, bit of leather, N not so much in the wood, this is kind of like almost the, the opposite of the, the Eagle Rare 17, this is more about the spirit, the oak is all kind of sat in the background, it's not really doing an awful lot, it's giving a little bit of tannin, a little bit of structure, but it's kind of just letting that wonderful mature spirit kind of come through, and it, oh, and it just has focus and vibrancy and intensity um, mm, that is really really impressive a little bit of licorice dark chocolate a little bit of treacle as well With slight wheatiness as well kind of there in the background and so maybe there is a little bit of wheat being used in in the mash bill maybe it is kind of like you know they've used a little bit of rye a little bit of wheat mm. That is just really complex. Now starting to get a little bit of that sort of soft, creamy vanilla kind of coming through. That sort of typical sort of uh, American oak kind of note. That's been one of the interesting things, actually. That the, all of these, the oak has been relatively um, kind of laid back. But then again, we are kind of in the premium echelons of 
uh, of, of bourbon. We're not sort of like you know your younger stuff, which is all kind of like corn and uh, corn and oak. Um, this is uh, this is the real McCoy, so to speak. Anyway, power time. Mmm, fresh, intense, crisp, almost mineral, um, and citric, and orangey, and um, mmm, wow, that's got some, some mmm to it, <laughs> technical term there, um, again, it's all about the spirit character, the oak is pretty much, you know, non-existent with regards to adding anything, and maybe a little bit of spice, a little bit of tannin, um, but it's all just kind of sat there and, and kind of just giving it a bit of kind of support, a bit of weight, you know. Um, it's uh, it's really intense, it's vibrant, it's crisp. Uh, I mean, this is 20 years old, for God's sake. You know, you would expect some old wood notes and a bit of, you know, old wood spice and stuff like that coming in. But mm, that spirit character is really, really at the forefront. Um, and, and again, it's kind of really harmonious. It's... The, the, the rye is kind of adding a little bit of herbal notes. There's a, a slight treacliness right on the back end, but it's that crisp citric kind of character um, that's that's really, really uh, impressive. And, oh, God, that is good. And finally, we're on to the Parker's Heritage. This is going to have to do something, shall we say, to uh, to top that particular bottling, but let's, uh, let's see what the nose goes. Oh, 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 oh no, that has depth, it has power. Um, oh, the smell of that rye. I mean, that's a lot of rye there. Um, sweet and spicy and slightly herbal and intense. A little bit of toffee, treacle. Oh, do you know what? I'm kind of more more towards this than I am the pappy. The pappy was stunning, but oh my god, this is incredible. Um, and a fraction of the price. Um, it's big, it's juicy, it's very American. Oh wow, that's got some really serious depth to it. Some darkness, some treacle, like I said, some spice. The rye is really in there and punching. This is obviously a high rye content bourbon. Um, a little bit of toffee, supporting oak. Again, not a huge amount of oak vanillins. Um, it's all very, very spirit focused. Mmm. Wow. Wow. Mm, even getting some raisinated fruit, some not a great deal of smoke, a little bit of spice. Um, yeah, wow. Better taste it. Intense, oily, dry. I got a mouthful of rose petaly ma kind of character going on here. I mean, what? I mean, this is 24 years old. It shouldn't have that character going on. Wow, this is all about the spirit. It's dark, it's intense. Um, got some lovely herbal, spicy rye. Loads and loads of rye kind of character. It's just like kind of really coming through. Um, mouth watering, sort of citric character happening in the background um some lovely soft oak just at the edges along with a little bit of um a little bit of corn as well but oh oh that rye is just like oh my god that's incredible um mm, mm, stunning absolutely stunning <laughs> Right, okay, so, episode 200, I can still taste it, cinnamon, I'm getting cinnamon and, and gorgeous kind of gingery spices and, 
Oh my god, that's incredible. I feel like Jeremy Clarkson talking about a Ferrari. Uh, I mean, that, that, that is absolutely stunning. But anyway, let's let's get back to the beginning. Mitch, just 10 year old. Yep, lovely bourbon. Um, good intensity. You know, just three figures. Nah, not worth it. Not worth it. 50 quid. Yep, no problem. I would have that in, you know no problem at all but 150 odd quid or 100 and whatever it was 128 mm, i think you're having a bit of a giraffe there i think um the the old forester yeah lovely bourbon very soft very kind of like relaxed and and just not what i would expect from something that's supposedly like prohibition style spirit you know you would expect the prohibition style spirit to be a lot more rough and ready shall we say but you know that is a lovely lovely bourbon uh the larue weller I, i've always had a soft spot for the rue the rue weller i mean i'd love to have one in my collection i mean i have a stag but you know no larue weller unfortunately and um, probably an oversight it has to be said because it just has that just unique character you know the wheated bourbons i mean i've got a, a wl well a 12 year old uh, which is kind of like the lesser version, shall we say. But uh, I just love that kind of like wheaty, dark, treacly kind of character that you get with the wheated bourbons. I mean, you know, they, they, I wish more were being produced, but there doesn't seem to be very much in the way of wheated bourbons about there. So, so bourbon distillers or um, American distillers, get making some bloody wheat. You know, there's, there's a shortage of it. There's a, a, a niche market there for you, shall we say. Um... Oh, well, done that one. <laughs> uh, Eagle Rare 17. Again, stunning whiskey. Lovely maturity. A lot of emphasis on, on the old wood, on the spice, the tannins, that kind of thing. And what you would expect from an old bourbon. You would expect all these kind of old wood notes happening. And if you like that sort of style, then certainly the Eagle Rare is not going to disappoint you. Um, that is an impressive whiskey. And the pappy, the pappy. Now, if I'd have ended this the, the, this, this flight of, of wonderful American whiskies on the pappy, I would be eulogising about it. It is stunning for such an old whisky. It has that lovely freshness and crispness and an intensity. Um, and it is truly gorgeous. £1,500 a bottle. Well, oh, God, I... No, it is not worth £1,500 a bottle. It is a collector's item. That is why it's £1,500 a bottle. The juice in that bottle is very, very good. Do not get me wrong about that. Uh, but it is not worth £1,500 in the slightest. Um, 500 quid, maybe. Yeah, I could probably say yes, you know, part with 500 quid and yeah that's it's going to be worth that but 1500 pounds no i'm afraid the collectors have really really pushed up the value of pappy van winkle and although it is very very good uh, it's not worth that kind of money when you taste it but let's be honest most pappy van winkle is going to sit in people's collections and just accumulate money why not you know it's you know that's that's the nature of these kind of beasties um the parker's heritage Oh my God! Now I would have this in a instant. If you get your hands on a bottle of this, buy it. It is stunning. Yes, it is three hundred pounds a bottle if you can find it. Um, but yeah, unbelievable. I mean, I know there are probably a number of you out there that kind of do follow the um, the limited release, the Parkers Heritage range, things like. There's probably <laughs> probably some of you that have got all of them and going, "Oh, look, I've got all of them," and. Um, yeah, you're a lucky sod, or you're a pretty wealthy sod, I should say, because um, that is stunning. Uh, that is just unbelievable. I mean, that really does kick the pants of the Pappy. I hate to say it, but it does. You know, the Pappy is brilliant, but the Parker's heritage is even better. <laughs> you know, it is kind of absolutely stunning. It is my 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 bourbon of the week should we say or my bourbon of this tasting it is absolutely stunning it I, yeah brilliant is is you know and i can remember giving it a really good 
score in uh, the whiskey magazine, I can't remember what I gave it, probably 9.4, 9.6, something like that, which is probably about as high as I'm ever going to score anything. I mean, I can't imagine something, I mean, even the stag I don't think would get to get to uh, 9.8 or 10. I mean, nothing ever gets to 10. This is an impossibility, really, at the end of the day. Um, there's no such thing as the perfect whiskey, and... Um, uh, I yeah, well, we're not going to go down that whole scoring kind of route. I find a very, very kind of tedious, shall we say? Um, but it's a kind of necessary evil when you are uh, judging competitions and so on and so forth. But anyway, that's this week's episode uh, in the bag. I think uh, looking at the time, I've got about two minutes left uh, on the <laughs> on the memory of the camera. So um, just basically just. Uh, Great to see you all back again. Well, not actually see you, but you know what I mean. Um, hopefully I've got some really interesting tastings coming up for you this year. Certainly I'm going to be looking at things like Glendronach. Uh, they've kindly sent me some samples. Uh, and Brookladdy, the new 10s that have been released. That will be uh, another one to, to look out for. Uh, and a few others uh, that, that I'll pick up along the way and uh, hopefully keep you, keep you guys entertained. So... One minute left on the clock. All that's left to say is Parker's Heritage. Oh my God, it's good. <laughs>